This is Danny Trejo, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Keep listening, or I'll take your head. All right, and we are back, and we're joined by the godfather of Gore himself, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Welcome to Without Your Head. <laughs> oh, what a pleasure to be with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing? Well, life is good, and business is good, and uh, I'm, I'm truly honored at my uh, advanced age to still be recognized. So I guess I can't ask for any more than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, everybody, no, you, you even got a website, HerschelGordonLewis.com. Oh, sure. That's my other career. As, as you may know, mm -hmm. uh, the film business is not always a good way to plan a, a deep future, as so many producers and directors have found. And uh, I've had very good fortune in, in uh, the world of marketing, where um, you know, in the film business, I was, always, I was regarded as an outlaw. I made the kind of movies nobody else would make. In the world of marketing, I'm, uh, I'm much more respected. I, and the question is, what do you want, notoriety or respect? <laughs> so I got a little bit of each. Um, in, in the world of business, has anyone like uh, recognized you, you know, from your films? Or, you know, oh, great or, here, it, it's funny because um, until the internet exposed me, the two worlds didn't collide. <laughs> I'd be giving a speech on marketing, and somebody might come up and say, "Hey, you know, there's this guy who used to make these goofy movies who has the same name you do." <laughs> I would say, "Well, I'll sue him," <laughs> or else uh, someone would come up and say, "Hey, I found you." And they'd have a, 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 a still photograph or something out of one of the, uh, the old movies. But as, as you're aware, the world has changed relative to instantaneous recognition. The first thing that happened was the uh, video cassette craze. And there's a fellow in California named Jimmy Maslin, a career out of buying up my old movies and releasing them on, originally on video cassette. And so the Renaissance began. And then with DVD, it was almost an explosion. And as you're aware, I think, a couple of years ago, we made Blood Feast 2. Mm -hmm. And so some people who thought I had long since expired said, hey, wait a minute, this guy is still around. <laughs> the result of that is that as we speak tonight, I am deep in negotiation for the production of Grim Fairy Tales, which I really do want to make because I feel the movie business, especially in horror films, has gone in a very peculiar direction, and I'm going to rescue it. <laughs> now, it that, that's something you talked about in some of the um, on the special edition DVDs on the commentary tracks. Was uh, a movie you wanted to do was the um, the Grim Fairy Tales. It's yeah, going to be no, like a, a bunch of short stories. Well, it's not really a bunch of short. You want to know the plot line of Grim Fairy Tales? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll expose it before it's even made. <laughs> Grim Fairy Tales is about a TV show, which is called Truth or Uh-Oh. And it opens <laughs> with this lunatic uh, MC. Who, All right, Janet, he said, you get the question right, you got a million dollars cash, a Mercedes-Benz 600, a, a villa in the Côte d'Azur, a trip around the world, but if you get it wrong, and the whole audience goes, Uh-Oh. He's he, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. He says, All right, here is your question. What was President Woodrow Wilson's first name? She senses a trap, but can't tell what it is. What the heck kind of question is? Come on, the clock is ticking. She's, uh, 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 Woodrow? Oh, uh, oh, you got it wrong. He says Woodrow Wilson's real first name was Thomas. Well, it's uh-oh time. time. And they go to this big spinning wheel, and the spins with his right arm. Whack! <laughs> She's lying there half-conscious, holding her right arm that's in what's left of her, in her left arm. He says, gee, I hope you were left-handed. She says, no, I was... Right. We want to come back next week and try again. Now, the whole idea here is to, is to marry gore and black humor and the intention, and this is one that I really believe in, because of some of the strange so-called splatter films I've seen of late, the intention is to have the audience understand immediately that the whole thing is a big joke. Mm -hmm. And that way the audience is with us, not trying to analyze the effects. So many movies we see today are pure CGI, kind of computer-generated images. Mm -hmm. 
for example, 300, the movie that, uh, that was number one at the box office for a couple of weeks in a row. Mm. Right. They shot the whole thing in somebody's garage, except for the computer-generated images. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is, is it's a deadpan kind of thing, which uh, I, I feel the industry should go beyond that. I think I'm talking too much. No, definitely not. Oh, I know what you mean. Like, uh, I was fascinated. Yeah, I was, I was going to bring up, like, in, in the Gorgor Girls uh, episode, when, well, the uh, scene where, you know, the nipples get cut off, and then the uh, milk comes okay. out. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I didn't want to think that on the air we should discuss that. That's an <laughs> interesting point you're making, by the way, the Gorgor mm -hmm. Girls, because when I shot that movie, I saw immediately the gender, not, not the gender gap, but the, the generation gap. People under age 35 thought it was an absolute hoot. People over age 55 thought I ought to be strung up by my you-know-what. Right. And, <laughs> and even today, uh, a couple of years ago, my buddy John Waters invited me to a horror film festival in Baltimore. I said, Baltimore? He said, I'll owe you. Like a moron, I went into Baltimore for his horror film festival. And they showed the Gorgor Girls. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was anybody in that audience, except maybe for John Waters and myself, who was even born when I made that movie. Mm -hmm. They were convulsed with laughter. They got it. They understood what was behind it. If this had been a, a, an audience of geezers, chances are they would have been outraged. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the, the, the coda to that story, I said, okay, John, you owe me. And when we made Blood Feast 2, Jackie Morgan, who was the producer of that movie, said, you're a friend of John Waters. I said, yeah. He said, I'd like him to be in this movie. I said, wait a minute. John is a director. He's not an actor. He said, well, ask him. So I called John Waters. And I said, you owe me. He said, uh-oh. <laughs> Great phrase. But he, ever the gentleman, and uh, he showed up in what, well, we shot it in what used to be New Orleans. And he played the part of a pedophile priest. And we had <laughs> right. a wonderful time. Yeah, that's uh, that's some great scenes in uh, Blood Feast oh, that, too, with John that's Waters. That's a classic scene. Yep, <laughs> yep. Well, what I was just going to say about that that scene though in uh, Gorgor Girls was, if the chocolate milk didn't come out, I think you know you would have just had a really dark image. But w you know, when you got the milk coming out, it, it makes it over the top and uh, humorous. You read it. You read it very, very well. The whole idea was to have people say how ridiculous. <laughs> but some people didn't see it that way. I figured maybe I should have had a darker colored chocolate. Oh, <laughs> uh, we should get a caller here. Who is this? This is Night Rider, guys. All right, you're on air with uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. You get a question? Yeah, I do. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's an honor to talk to H. G. Lewis. He's one of my uh, biggest. Ends of directors along with Quentin Tarantino. And I like I just this hope... call so far. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get his thoughts on Quentin Tarantino. That's an unfair question. <laughs> and I'll tell you why it is. The most recent Quentin Tarantino output is one that I... Uh, Grindhouse, I think you're talking about, or we, we may both be talking about. Mm -hmm. In my opinion... When you start off with a movie like Pulp Fiction, and you set yourself an image, and then you come back with other stuff like Kill Bill, which I thought was a little strange, <laughs> and that's a euphemism. Uh, now, how, how he comes with Rodriguez, and they have this double featuring little thing called Grindhouse, in which, in a sense, they are ridiculing movies that really weren't made to be ridiculed or even to be analyzed. It's a different, it's really a different world altogether. And I don't think they understood the nature of these movies because in, I had, now I'm talking blindly because I haven't seen Grindhouse. All I've seen is a whole bunch of hype on it. Mm -hmm. And the point I would make to you relative to Grindhouse is the way they exploited this movie, in my opinion, is incorrect because they gave away too much information on a negative level before they opened. And as a result, last weekend, they opened in position number four. Mm -hmm. with, uh, they grossed $11 million the first weekend. Now, that's a lot of money, but it's not compared with the, with the uh, production cost of mm -hmm. that thing. And, but, you know, the amount of uh, advertising. I mean, oh, the advertising was horrendous. And they opened way, way weaker than other movies, including a cartoon. 
because, in my opinion, what they have overlooked in this kind of thing is that the purpose of a motion picture that you show in a theater, or whether you're going to just sell some DVDs, is to entertain the audience. And I don't see entertainment in that conglomeration that they put together, much as I admire those two guys. Mm -hmm. Wrong oh. answer, isn't it? No, it's, uh, well, along those lines, how important do you think uh, the trailer is, like a good trailer for a movie? We used to call the trailer the coming atrocity. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, we wound up, you see, originally when I first started making movies, I didn't want to put good stuff in the trailer. I felt that was giving too much away. Mm -hmm. Later, we began to shoot stuff expressly for the trailer to get some bodies in the seats. Because if that doesn't happen, everything is theory rather than fact. So the trailer and the campaign, in my opinion, are crucial to the success of a movie, sometimes more so than what's actually on the screen. We proved that over and over again with movies that were nothing much more than hype. Now, there's a phrase they use in the film business that a movie has le legs, L-E-G-S, or it doesn't have legs. And the difference, really, if it opens strong and then dies, what it means is the campaign was great and the movie stinks. Mm -hmm. If it just gradually builds, it means that the the campaign stank and the movie was good. Right. If it opens Word strong mouth, and right. stays strong, which is an increasing rarity today, mm -hmm. it means that both both pieces fit together very very well. And you look at some, and people think that the star names make a gigantic difference. Star names are no longer the the alpha and omega they used to be. And if you remember back a, a few years ago when Tom Hanks was in a movie called. A bonfire of the Vanities. Right. That movie lost it. Literally lost its rear end. The most recent one I can think of is a thing called The Island, which had Scarlett Johansson and I've forgotten who her her uh, mm -hmm. co-star was. Ewan McGregor, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that movie cost over a hundred and twenty million dollars to make. It doesn't show, by the way. <laughs> That's another point <laughs> I'd make to you. And it didn't gross back even uh, close to a third of its production cost. Now, if I'm going to lose something like, uh, what, uh, $90 million on a movie, that will hurt. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but both these people, both the stars of that movie, go on to the next movie or the next disaster. So you, they have the backing that makes it possible to absorb disaster. I, the typical independent filmmaker does not have that kind of a luxury. We live on our wits. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to open a movie, and I don't care if the movie is going to open in uh, Radio City Music Hall or in Blockbuster or uh, just on Netflix, right. the, the campaign really is a, a major, major factor. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask quick too, um, you know, something that really wasn't around back then would be like uh, merchandising. Is he, they have action figures now like uh, Jason Voorhees and everything. Has anyone ever asked you to like come out with like a... A Fouad Ramsey's or an Adam Sorg uh, action figure? Uh, if, if they did, it wouldn't have passed through my hands, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> right. By the time these movies became main... See, I, I am a testament to the fact that if you live long enough, you become legitimate. <laughs> but I don't own these movies anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm strictly the icon through, through which they're recognized. So you know, any negotiations for for any kind of a deal... For example, they just remade my movie, The Wizard of Gore. Mm -hmm. As I think you know, Kristen... Kristen Chris Big Lover, Lover, yeah. He plays yeah. Montag. He plays Montag. My relationship with that is simply one of interested observer. Now, yes, Jimmy Maslin, the guy who owns these movies, does tend to share these things with me just as I share things with him. For mm -hmm. example, the only thing I still own out of these movies is the music for Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs, which I wrote and music is a different set of rights. So on occasion, uh, I will let those rights go. For Somebody made uh, 2001 Maniacs, Tim, Tim Sullivan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they, made a, they made a deal with me to uh, use the music. I simply signed a piece of paper authorizing them to use the music. As for action figures, if you make an action figure of Adam Sorg or, or Fuad Ramsey's, 
uh, I think it's a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I, it's more, it's, I think it's more true of Fuad Ramsey's than of yeah. Adam Sorg mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of people now know that Blood Feast was a watershed picture. And it certainly had almost no production value. And the reason it had no production value is that I did or did not do something that the major companies don't or do. And that is watch the budget just in case. If Blood Feast had been a, a flop, mm -hmm. it couldn't have been a total flop. Because enough theaters would have shown it. And that uh, was at a time when theaters were the only place to make money. Today, a lot of films, are, especially the digital stuff, uh, they're released directly to, uh, video, to video, video or to, through video stores mm -hmm. or to maybe the TV. And uh, I was not about to take a big bath on that movie. So no matter what had happened, we weren't going to be in trouble. So if, if I had made a movie which cost $120 million and lost, not what, uh, $90 million of that, uh, I, that would have really put me out of business perhaps permanently. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between independent filmmaking and studio-backed filmmaking. Uh, do you have a question from the board, uh, John? Uh, RRM, actually. He wants to know, uh, is it true that you sang the song for 2000 Maniacs? Oh, sure. That's my voice on the soundtrack. And the reason behind that, we had a very nice group of guitar and, and banjo players as backup on that on that movie and when it came time to, to play the theme song to record uh, I had the entire cast and crew that's another benefit of independent filmmaking it's sort of a team effort everybody gets along it's a major factor you cannot have someone sulking in a dressing room waiting for a hairdresser to show up and so we, we, we uh, assembled in this little recording studio in Orlando. And the reason I wanted them all there is because the key to the theme song of 2000 Maniacs is a rebel yell, yee-haw. And I wanted the whole bunch of them going, yee-haw. Mm -hmm. And the first line of, of the uh, lines of the song, and there's a story you should know from a hundred years ago. And that's the way it goes. Well, the lead singer of this group turned out to be a tenor. And it was, there's a story you should know. I said, wait a minute, it's not macho. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody is standing around saying, come on, we want to go have dinner. <laughs> well, uh, since I had written that music, and I knew the lyrics, and of course, and the tempo very, very well, and I had just about the deepest voice in the room, I did it myself. Hmm. But it wasn't done out of ego. It was done because I didn't want to pay somebody else for it, and there was nobody else to do it. <laughs> so my voice, yes, is on the soundtrack, and uh, every now and then, when I when I go to a, uh, a one of these horror film festivals, mm -hmm. they'll ask me, <laughs> can I still sing that soundtrack? You bet I can sing this. <laughs> I know every word of that, that theme song. I was just thinking, maybe we can get the uh, Without Your Head theme song sung by H.G. Uh, <laughs> <H>. Lewis. <laughs> You've got you've got a uh, a fan, uh, horror fest coming up, I guess, uh, by Rue Morick the magazine in yeah, uh, Toronto. That's, in, that's I think in August, July or August. I can look it up if you like. Oh. That's going to be in Toronto, and uh, Rue Morick, as you may or may not know, is I guess one of the leading horror film magazines. It's it's published in Canada, but it distributes all over the world. And there, there's another factor to it. They are nice people, mm -hmm. and it, what's strange is. As I tend to wander through the strange, the odd world, half world of filmmaking, I found that the people who make independent horror films are just about the nicest people in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a subjective reaction, but it, it, seems, to, it seems to be that way for me. Mm, well, that's cool. Uh, speak then, of, then they go next month, I've got one uh, in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, Texas I don't make a career out of this. Some people do. They go from show to show, mm -hmm. signing autographs and charging for them. Yes, yeah. that ain't my style. Have you seen them really like um, grow over the years? Oh, there's, there's almost one every month now. Oh yeah. Well, that's a, see, again. I'm a, I'm either 
congratulated for or accused of starting the whole thing. <laughs> we made Blood Feast. There was no such thing as a horror film festival because there weren't that. There were no movies of that type. Yes, there were there were Bela Lugosi Dracula movies, mm -hmm. but you, you couldn't get Bela Lugosi, who was really a, a druggie anyway, to show up at a uh, and, and do what? What would he have done? Mm -hmm. Now we have a whole cadre of people, and the stuff, the stuff's being ground out like so much hamburger. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there, are, there is plenty now to go around. Mm -hmm. And I'm stunned even now at the number of, of people who are now in this little business, and a lot of them are making money, and a lot of them are having a good time. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of music, uh, how did you get Southern Culture on the skids to do the music for a Blood Feast 2? That that's that's one of the highlights of the film. Yeah, Jackie Morgan got them. Uh, what you'll find, I think, and I say this to almost anybody who might be listening who is making a movie, you let word get around that you're going to make a movie. And even if your movie is shot on your own little digital camera and most of the cast and crew are your schoolmates or your cronies, if word gets into the press of any sort, and I don't care if it's a local neighborhood n newspaper or if it's in Variety, you will suddenly start getting emails from people saying, can we do the music? Mm -hmm. Because exposure is a major key. And that's true of every facet of movie making. People in the, in the business or the, pe the would-bes who want to be in the business would much rather have a screen credit than have money. I think that's smart on their part, by the way. Mm -hmm. And as, as a, a producer, uh, you can exploit that, saying, wait a minute, somebody wants more money. You say, oh, well, I don't have any more budget for this, but I'll give you a full screen credit with just your name on it. Mm -hmm. And you would be, you, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't be surprised how effective <laughs> that is as a negotiating tool. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I actually never heard of the band before that. And, uh, you know, just from that movie, I went and looked them up. Mm. So, you know, it worked. Well, yesterday I got a, 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 a beautiful DVD from a, a garage band called the Gorgor Gore Girls. And they have <laughs> named their, their group after the, the Gorgor Gore Girls movie. Mm -hmm. And they were very gracious enough to send me an autographed DVD. <laughs> so you see, this stuff lives uh -huh. for decades after it first starts. It lives. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, too, uh, who makes the best fried chicken? Because... Uh that well, appears a lot in your movies. That's, you see, there's an area in which I do claim expertise. <laughs> <laughs> I like Bojangles. Now, in fact, I went into morning. The local Bojangles here in Fort Lauderdale, where I live, closed down. That left me with Popeyes or Kentucky Fried. Mm -hmm. And there's no question in my mind that the Popeyes fried chicken, and you've got to be careful. You order the spicy, not the regular. Yeah. If that's the route to take. <laughs> because uh, if, if you... <laughs> But sometimes, sometimes they they falter. But generally speaking, Popeye's fried chicken is is quite adequate. Yeah, that's very good. I have all I have to, I have to say, my grandmother's fried chicken's the best. Or I else she'll be mad. That, right. <laughs> I, it occurs to me I ought to have some sort of a, a, a fried chicken tasting contest in which I'm the sole judge. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, RM also wanted to know. He's got a question here. Does it sadden you that the social experience of movie going is dying out these days with the death of uh, drive-ins and the advent of uh, home theaters? Well, you see, the drive-ins, of course, re represented the major outlet for a lot of independent filmmakers. That's because drive-ins traditionally would show two movies of a night, and one of them could be a piece of crap, and that would be mine. <laughs> well, I don't know that drive-ins were that sociable. In fact, I, if you if you go to a theater today the amount of sociability I think is over the top. People who have grown up watching at home looking at a TV monitor and talking while it happens think nothing of going into a theater and doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you will find uh, a lot of the the older people, the senior citizens saying, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I'm never going to come back to a theater. I got there talking all the way through it. Uh, that kind of soci sociability is not a good idea. And the Drive-ins also used to play the kind of product, not just mine, that many hardtop theaters wouldn't play. And so that, that of course, is also in Eclipse. And the drive-ins that remain, sometimes now will have seven or eight screens. It's a different world. 
and you either adapt or you die, or else you go in directly into uh, into video stores. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what advice would you give uh, someone who wanted to start making their own movies, get involved in independent uh, films? I would give anybody who wants to make his own movie a bit of brutal advice. Number one, don't hand hold the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, if you have a friend who claims to be an actor, make certain that person can act. <laughs> Number three, and this, this is a crucial item, consider the people who do not know who you are, who are not aware that you're another mad genius, and you say to yourself, yes, I, I am much superior to them in intellect, but they are the grist for my mill, and I am determined to entertain them, not to startle them, with, with some sort of a strange uh, plot line that makes sense only to me. <laughs> I hope that aborts some <laughs> projects that might be underway right. and encourages uh, others. Right. Well, that you, just killed my movie. I'm going to stop production well, on, right now. <laughs> on that happy note, gentlemen, I guess I'm going to retire for the evening, but I really have had a good time with this. This is an unusual kind of, of conversation for me. All right. Well, I uh, really appreciate you coming on tonight. A pleasure, believe me. It was mine. No. So, all right, Neil, John, uh, Troy. Troy, I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. All right. Hey, this is Adam Green, the director of Hatchet, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. How are you doing? This is Lance Hendrickson, and you're listening to Without Your Head.